first section, Flyover Country, uh, about the Great Plains, you connect the Dust Bowl to the advent of the GMO. You were just speaking about the Dust Bowl. 20, gosh. This was really uh, opening for us. Um, we never thought of that. Can you uh, talk about My name's about Caitlin Shetterly. Um, I, oh, well, I just, um, I think I was watching the Dust Bowl, uh, the Ken Burns, and then I started reading about the Dust Bowl, and I realized, oh, my God. This is why these chemical companies were able to come in in the late 70s and the early 80s um, and say, all your problems will be solved. Because a lot of these farmers, it was their parents or their grandparents, who often were still alive and maybe still farming too. And the Dust Bowl wasn't that long ago. And their lives had been, um, you know, tragically uh, taken off course in the best case scenario. If not, some people's lives were ruined, obviously, and, and some people died, and um, some people lost their farms forever. So th coming to that part of the country, so this is post-tapping of the Agalala aqu aquifer, which is also, you know, running dry, but basically which the idea for that was that you'll never have a drought again. So coming to that part of the country and saying, well, we can take care of everything. We can give you drought-resistant seeds. We can give you seeds that will resist every pest. We can, um, m you know, make it so the topsoil will never blow away again. You won't have to till, you, you know, it, uh, all you do is spray all these magic potions. These people were very vulnerable to this, and uh, this, was th this was still part of their family history. Um, so the connection to the Dust Bowl is very important and not one that um, I've ever known anyone else to make. Um, but it was like a lightning bolt that hit me when I was doing all the research and then when I started interviewing people in the Midwest and I realized how close it was for them. I mean, that's quite remarkable that no one else is really speaking about that because when you say it, it just seems to make so much sense. It makes so much sense. I don't know why nobody else. I, I feel like I should have written a whole book about that um, in a way. I mean, that's a topic that I wish more people would ask me about and I wish, um, you know, I'd like to spend more time on because I think it's really important. I do think we've tried it. We tend to forget the vulnerability of people in these stories and what tragedies they're bringing, personal tragedies and, you know, their humanity to making these decisions. I mean, the farmers who have chosen to grow GMOs are not bad people. And we can't forget that. We can't forget um, what, they, what they have brought of their history to this moment and why they were so vulnerable to the companies. Um, it's interesting because although the acronym GMO is in the subtitle of your book, it really becomes a book about the environment. Um, in the section on the Great Plains, you spend a lot of time with a young, handsome GMO farmer named Zach Honeycutt. Um, he tells you all the pesticides he uses on his crops. This was particularly eye-opening. Uh, we realized at that point that the revelation of the book is that the GMO is one thing, but that the pesticides are a much larger issue. And you mentioned this in, in one of your answers earlier. Um, one, however, that is intrinsically tied to the GMOs, of course, are the pesticides. Um, we realized at the point that the revelation of the book is that the GMO is one thing, but that the pesticides are a much larger issue. One, however, that is intrinsically tied to the GMOs. Can you talk a bit about how this began to become one of the stronger threads of the book? Yeah. Um... I, you know, the, I went into this trying to understand what a GMO was, and then I realized that the GMOs are tied to the pesticides. The same companies that are modifying 90% of our seeds are also making the pesticides that go with them. You can't have one without the other. The GMO is a seed which is genetically modified to withstand the widespread and um, constant use of a pesticide, Roundup. Um, it's an herbicide that will kill everything around it but that one thing. So... Um, the, the, the plant that you're cultivating. So these things are, are tied to each other. I became less interested in the actual, the seed itself, and much more interested in all the pesticides that are going, are, are used on these crops. I became very concerned about what we're using on the, uh, the soil and on our crops and how that's getting into our air, um, our water. And I mean, some of these um, pesticides will stay in the soil for 38 years or longer and continue to be taken up by the roots of plants, and so, you know, it's not good. Glyphosate, registered as Roundup by Monsanto, has been recently found to be a carcinogen, and there are lawsuits pending on the subject, um, yet it's used on crops and patios worldwide. 
What do you know about glyphosate? Well, I mean, there are pending lawsuits right now um, against Monsanto because the glyphosate has been found to be a carcinogen and to cause uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma for sure. Um, you know, we shouldn't be using it. No one should be using it. And um, it's been banned in some places in Europe. Um, so the, 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 the writing's on the wall, except for we live in a country where industry always wins out. So it's going to take a lot of effort to get it off the shelves. In the book, you discuss a research recession and also that a lot of the research on chemicals and GMOs are funded by the biotech companies that make them, which you were really just alluding to. Can we discuss this? Um, yeah, so there just isn't enough funding for research. So that's a problem. And the way that a lot of scientists get funding is through the company's industry. So there's an inherent conflict of interest. Um, and many scientists have to sign, you know, that they agreements that they won't publish or they won't publish anything negative they find or um, things like that. So when this becomes interesting is when a scientist decides to buck that. Like one of the scientists in my book, Tyrone Hayes, he um, found that atrazine, which is an herbicide, was causing um, gender abnormalities in frogs. Um, and when he decided to publish anyway, he was breaking a contract and then he was in a very long lawsuit with the company, with Syngenta. So yeah, it's a, it's a problem. Biotech companies are, um, industry is supporting most of the research in all, in all of our universities. There's almost no independent research anymore. So what does that mean? I think we all have to answer that question um, and think about it. And then I don't know what one does about it, but um, it's important to look at all angles of an issue before deciding that a company is telling us the truth. You also write that Americans are sicker than ever. How tied is this in your mind to our food? Oh, I think food is you know, essential to how our general wellness and um, anything from obesity to heart disease to um, diabetes, to the autoimmune epidemic, to allergies. Um, it's all tied to our food and our environment, and it, it's very serious. What are some of the surprising ways GMOs sneak into our lives? GMOs are used for plastic, for biofuel, for um, as additives. There are lots of um, substances, which are certainly not organic, that are allowed in organic processed foods, like organic pre-made foods chemicals and additives, preservatives, things like that. Um, they're often made from GMO corn or soy, natural flavors, you know, um, uh, anti-caking agents, um, salts, you know, all those things are, are often made from GMOs. So um, the bigger question again is not so much the GMO, but the pesticide load that they all carry. So that way pesticides make their way into everything we're eating. We know you grew up in a very politically active and artistic uh, Maine family. Did you become an activist while you were writing this book? I don't really consider myself an activist. I consider myself a writer. I've written about all kinds of different things. I published a piece last year in the, in the Times about, you know, uh, a sexual harassment situation I had. And I've, I've just been writing about Maine's new governor, um, uh, Janet Mills. I mean, I... Um, I don't consider myself an activist. I do have a politically active family, um, but uh, I'm a writer first, and I'm interested in human stories and stories that are interesting to me. And of course, if I can elucidate some sort of truth that's been covered up, that's terrific. You wrote in your memoir, Made for You and Me, that your parents were part of the Back to the Land movement. How did your childhood affect your writing of Modified? Oh, that's an interesting thing to ask. I, you know, I think because there's so much of me that as a child, we had a very pure existence. My parents grew a lot of what we ate. We had big gardens. We lived in the woods. Um, and it was shocking to me to learn what we're doing to the planet with the food we're growing and how much more simple it could be. And it's too bad that we've gotten so far from uh, just g growing food to sustain, not to make money.